Everyone knows the United States is Israel's best friend. The U.S. gives Israel billions of dollars in aid annually, consistently blocks UN Security Council resolutions condemning Israel, and backs its military offensives publicly. But why? What's the thinking behind America going above and beyond for Israel? The short version, it's imperialism. The long version is that it's a tight interplay of America's long-running Middle East strategy, U.S. public opinion electoral politics, and a pro-Israel lobbying campaign. So here's the explanation of why the United States support Israel. Since Israel's founding in 1948, the U.S. has been its biggest donor of military aid. This support has included financial assistance and weaponry during various conflicts that have resulted in the loss of lives for many Palestinians and the displacement of millions. Politicians are constantly invoking the U.S. commitment to Israel and constantly branding any criticism of Israel as anti-Semitic. Each year, Washington sends $3.8 billion in aid and an additional $8 billion in loan guarantees. Former U.S. President Harry Truman was the first world leader to recognize Israel when it was created in 1948. In part because of personal ties, Truman's former business partner, Edward Jacobson, played a pivotal role in laying the groundwork for the U.S. in recognizing Israel as a state. But there were also an important strategic considerations driving the decision. As World War II ended, capitalist competition was rapidly globalizing. The United States was an emerging superpower, hungrily eyeing the Middle East's newly discovered and vast oil deposits. A 1945 State Department memo described these deposits as a stupendous source of strategic power and one of the greatest material prizes in world history. With the Middle East holding strategic importance aside to its oil reserves, the crucial waterways such as the Suez Canal, it became a critical playground for superpower dominance. As the influence of European powers waned, the U.S. stepped in as the primary Western power broker in the region. The U.S. ruling class wanted that oil, but invasion and colonization wasn't an option. That would have required ongoing direct rule, which would have been fantastically difficult and expensive to support from thousands of miles away. Additionally, in the late 50s and early 60s, Arab nationalism was sweeping across the Middle East. In Egypt, President Gamal Abdel Nasser struggled to throw off British imperialism and unite Arab countries. Anti-imperial struggles erupted across the region, threatening to expel Western powers. These uprisings meant a highly unstable region, which made for a terrible investment climate. Still worse from the American point of view, many of these nations were moving closer to the Soviet Union. The United States was forced to seek allies in the region, to pull Arab countries into its orbit. It argued that capitalist democracy was superior to Soviet communism for their development. In June 1967, the Six-Day War made it clear to both the United States and Israel that a partnership was a good idea. A central motivation for Arab nationalism was an opposition to Israeli intervention in the region. Military tensions rose on all Israel's borders until Israel invaded the Jordanian-controlled West Bank, launched airstrikes over Syria, and attacked Egypt. Within six days, Israel had won a decisive land war and took control of the Gaza Strip and the Sinai Peninsula from Egypt, the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, from Jordan, and the Golan Heights from Syria. Israel proved its ability to militarily overpower its neighbors. If made an ally, American power brokers realized the United States could use Israel to exert control indirectly. The United States quickly replaced Britain and France as Israel's new and more committed imperial sponsor. In the year before the Six-Day War, total U.S. aid to Israel was $23.7 million. In its aftermath, U.S. support skyrocketed to $106 million annually. In return, Washington got what was effectively a U.S. military outpost in what American military strategists determined was the most important region in the world. No price tag was too high for what the United States got out of the deal. An indigenous intelligence service. Troops. Trained and familiar with the territory. And ideologically committed. And all the weapons they would ever need there in the Middle East. There was no need to convince the U.S. public for a military incursion 
or to deploy the U.S. military thousands of miles away. A conservative estimate of the cost of the United States to handle all this itself is at least $125 billion. Getting all that for an initial outlay of $106 million per year was, for Washington, a bargain. It's been a windfall for U.S. defense corporations, too. Billions of dollars the United States sends to Israel wind up coming back to its military industry. For example, a 2010 agreement between the United States and Israel allows for Israel to use a total of $15.2 billion in military grants from the United States to buy F-35 fighters from Lockheed Martin. Thus began the United States and Israel's special relationship in the ensuing half-century. The Egyptian and Syrian armies attacked Israel, striking on different fronts and each seeing early victories. But Israel was able to fight back, scoring air and sea wins, and driving the Egyptian and Syrian armies back. To draw in U.S. support, Mir ordered planes with nuclear missiles to stand by on alert. It worked. Nixon ordered weapons and supplies to be airlifted to Israel. The supplies arrived just as Israel was starting to get the advantage, trapping a section of the Egyptian army with no access to food or water. Kissinger saw the situation as a strategic opportunity. Israel had again demonstrated definitively that it could militarily dominate other nations in the region and keep its enemies at bay. But Israeli might was dependent on Washington for funds, weaponry, and diplomatic cover. And the United States got to position itself as the only force that could keep Israel in check. Kissinger was not alone in recognizing this value. In 1973, Total U.S. aid to Israel stood at $492.8 million. The following year, funding exploded to $2.6 billion, an increase of 530%. Therefore, the basis of American support for Israel is to support its obedient, attacking dog, the dog of colonialism and imperialism. <laughs>